Кронис uh, от скоро е в България, от uh, юли месец. Uh, доста така uh, сериозни амбиции имаме uh, като софтуерна компания да подпомагаме комьюнититата в uh, различни сфери, включително uh, VGS комьюнитито, което в България надяваме се да подпомогнем сериозното му разрастване. Uh, като глобален лидер в Cyber Protection ние работим в доста така разъобразни сфери в IT бранша, не само в UGS. А, имаме доста клиенти и цифрички на слайда, но това върху което се фокусираме е възможността на нашите клиенти и а, крайни потребители в крайна сметка да се чувстват защитени. А, това означава не само като сигурност на данните, може би сте чували за Кронис покрай Бека, покрай True Image, продуктите ни, които а, така са доста популярни и редовно печелят някакви награди а, за най-добър потребителски бекъп. А, но така или иначе, бекъп е така една малка част от а, сигурността на данните и това, което ние наричаме Cyber Protection. А, общо взето обединява, освен сигурността на данните, обединява а, така, privacy, authenticity, security или така наречените SAPAS, пете а, тенденции, върху които ние се фокусираме като компания. Uh, така, различните иновации, освен естествено фронтен uh, технологиите, JavaScript технологиите, uh, върху които работи компанията и върху които също uh, доста активно ще работим в uh, различните комьюнити през uh, се, дълги години напред. В България са свързани с uh, както с клауд инфраструктурата ни, с uh, блокчейн технологиите, които използваме, за да можем да валидираме данни с AI, така, доста известни думички, които използвам. Истината е, че ние всъщност сме едни от, от първите в, в сферата, които ги интегрират за нещо много така полезно, ежедневно. Примерно AI го ползваме за ransomware protection. Ransomware, знаете, атаките са доста популярни напоследък. Криптират ви компютъра, включително на фирми, служители, криптират им компютъра, искат им после откуп за, за данните. Ние използваме AI, за да може да засичаме. Вече сме засекли някъде четок статистика, може би някой колега може да ме поправи, някъде около 200 000 подобни атаки сме предотвратили. Блокчейн технологията ползваме за Валидиране и сигничър на файлове, на, на бекъпи дори, тъй като в крайна сметка потребителят трябва да е спокоен, а, че а, има това, което то е бекъп, но наистина е това, което получава в последствие при рестор. А, така, продуктите ни, които са доста на брой, тук са изброени, а, това поради което а, в крайна сметка се спряхме и на Vue.js като технология, Една от причините е, че се фокусирахме върху клауд решения. Продаваме предимно малък, среден бизнес, крайни потребители също. За всички тези групи от хора, знаете, клауд решенията са доста очевиден избор. Много по-малко се инвестира в инфраструктура и поред имаме дейта центрове, тук се виждат на доста места по света. Като ще... Имайки предвид, че до преди две години нямахме нито един, доста бързо разрастваме клауд инфраструктурата ни. Като Идеята е, че всичките ни решения се интегрират през нашата клауд инфраструктура и за нас е много важно крайния потребител да има един и същ а, така, user experience, да използваме чуждицата, на, на, във всичките ни продукти, във всичките ни устройства, във всичките а, крайна сметка, в, интерфейси, през които може да, да достъпва нашите приложения. А, направихме немалък ресърч, пробвахме различни технологии, Uh, общо взето всички така популярни в момента uh, технологии, които uh, малко или много дори правихме пилотни проекти по, по някои от тях. Uh, в крайна сметка се спряхме на, на, специално на, на Vue.js uh, и uh, от последната така, година и половина доста активно uh, да разработваме всичките ни решения, предвижваме целия ни Софтуерен екип в посока на използване на, на специално на тази технология, специално на уеднаквяване, така да го кажем, на експириенса за крайния потребител, а, като, като а, в крайна сметка, особено в клауд среда, където на един клик разстояние са всичките ни продукти. 
не се налага човек да се инсталира отделно един, после отделно друг, после отделно трети. Благодаря. Общо взето тук колегите от, от компанията и от други компании, които сме поканили. Надявам се, че няма да е първото и последното им идване в България. Ще подпомагаме всякакъв вид събития, включително като организатори, като с помощта на нашите партньори и с помощта на нашите колеги в всякакъв вид събития сме така доста активни и с удоволствие ще участваме. Благодаря. Uh, my name is Sergei Karnienka. I'm not from Akronis yet, but I'm working as a front-end team, front -end, something with front-end, making websites at Beta Moscow. Actually, we're a digital production, a quite small company, just 25 people. But our main uh, product is website. We're making like a couple of websites per month. So this is what we do in, on everyday basics. And... Uh, One of our main uh, goals is animations, as many <laughs> as we can do, because this is our products. Mainly we, we're doing like promo websites, uh, websites for some events. So I just want to share my experience about animations with UGS, with you guys. Um, bam, bam, bam. Wait a moment. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm going to show you, I'm going to break down the real case. There is the website. This is the link, 2017.bespravok.ru. Bespravok means no comments. It's, uh, actually, it's a big party in Moscow. The last time there was one and a half thousand people, all developers or designers or creativity, digital people, but whatever. This is our um, uh, beta website. This is not for customers, and that's why I can share the code. I can explain how it works and so on. So, as I mentioned before, the goal is create a complex timeline animations. When I mean timeline animations, it means like one thing starts exactly when another thing finished and you can control it and this is how it works. So, this is the transition example. This is the peer page transition, then before leave page transition, then another page transition. I know probably now it looks like not a... Uh, not like uh, not like I know English very well, but <laughs> so I'm going to break down how it works in details, like step by step, how to create these uh, complex transitions in View Router, how to handle all these animations, and let's start with our tools list. So how we can uh, manage this. First of all, we have conditional CSS classes. I think, actually, how many of you already work with UGS? Can you raise your hands up, please? And at least half of people. And how many of you didn't try UGS yet? It's all right. You're going to try it soon. So the conditional CSS class is probably most of you already heard about it. It's a very simple tool. I'm going to break down it later. Then built-in components transition and transition group. I'm going to talk about it as well. Then we're going to move to JavaScript twin libraries. I'm going to use GreenSock in this example, but you can pick whatever library you like. Then we'll talk about your router navigation guards and component lifecycle hooks. And all these tools are used in the example I showed you before. So let's start. <coughs> uh, here's the conditional CSS classes, the simplest tool we have in view, uh, which is binding in class, depend on some reactive data. Like in this case, uh, this is the actual code of our mute button. So it has CSS class muted if the store tells us that it's mute. Works quite simple. When you click it, you make it mute, the CSS class apply, and it becomes transparent. So nothing really complicated. But we're going to improve it a little bit. You can use, with CSS classes, you can use like keyframe animation, and it's already look a bit more interesting, like this animation of no when you're entering the wrong answer. This is the same conditional CSS class. You just add in the class and you're done. But this is not enough, probably. So uh, UGS offers us the built-in component transition. 
uh, it works especially for animation. It has a couple of settings, and basically the principle is like you wrap anyone anything you like in this companion transition, and then you can control the animation of this uh, uh, element, like when it's appear or disappear, and control it with CSS classes or with directives like mod out in. So in this case, we wrap with transition uh, a small kind of model window. And let me first show how it looks like. So this is how it appears. A simple transition. And uh, this is the code. Uh, all you need to do to animate the appear or disappear of HTML element with transition component, you just need to describe the animation you want in CSS classes. We enter and we leave to, it means the element is starts and finished with this transform scale zero. And uh, you have uh, six CSS classes to control the transition state of the elements. Three classes for entering and same three classes but for leaving. I will not stop like uh, for a long time here, but hopefully you, all of you will check the documentation, the gorgeous UGS documentation. I have to say the best ever in world of JavaScript frameworks, and uh, for sure you find the better explanation of this structure because it's in Bulgarian, and I cannot even say hello <coughs> in Bulgarian. So this is the CSS way to control the transition with the component. Also, we have a couple of settings like appear. If you will put the appear directive in transition component, it will work like you don't need any uh, any conditions to apply the animation. It's just right away will start. For example, if you want to animate something when user opens the page without any reasons, <laughs> you just put the wrap it with transition component, put the appear directive, and then you're done. Like it's gonna work. Also, you have the mod option. It describes how it works in, a, like, if it's in out, it means like the first component gonna in and then out animation. And also, it has out in option. It uh, works opposite. Uh, and more and more and more uh, directives like duration. You can configure it with CSS classes, or if you like to put it in HTML, you can use options like duration. Many of them, but also you have to know about JavaScript hooks. Uh, if you need to control your animation lifecycle, for example, you want to do something when the transition is going to end or when K-frame is finished, you can write it with the transition component hook directive, like we on leave. And before leave, like you can choose the any step you want to control. So. The same behavior with transition group, but just one difference. Uh, transition is used for single components or node elements, and transitions group for used for group of elements. But all you have to remember, you need to use the K directive, which uh, is uh, which tells you that this is different elements. So the K must be different. And this is the amazing example from documentation, like. Looks quite gorgeous, but I, I'm not, uh, I don't have example for transition group because at the best product website I use JavaScript Win libraries and that's why I didn't use the transition group. But basically this is how it works, it just animate all together, all the elements. So this is the two built-in Vue.js tools, the conditional CSS classes and transition component. Let's talk about pros. It's obviously it's a quick start. You have it right away. It's quite easy to to write. I mean, this is just couple of uh, couple of lines of code, and you have animations. No dependencies, and it works really fast because it's based on CSS mostly. But also, it's not enough to to build a timeline animation, and we don't have any controls, like we cannot rewind the, this animation or make it slower or faster right away, or just pause it. So if you need to do something like this, you might need a JavaScript Twin library. In this case, um, in this case I'm gonna talk about GreenSock. And here, the video, 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 in a slow motion, how works the transition when you 
switch the page. So basically it starts from, hey, you gonna play or not? Yeah. <coughs> one by one elements disappearing. So how it works. This is the method, finally we have some JavaScript. This is the method that uh, describes how the elements disappearing with the green sock code. So this is how we hide the ground. Uh, the main thing I want to show you, please notice that we're using promise and at the end when the whole animation is gone, like it was transparent and visible again, then transparent and visible, doesn't matter how much time it takes, but at the end it resolves. Like we want to be sure that we know when the animation will finished. We just can say this hide bg that then, and the next method will fire only when it's resolved. So this is the first pros, or the first, the good part about JavaScript libraries. You can control it quite well. Then after we hide the background, the next animation start. We show in the next page. So one by one, elements appearing on the page. And this is the method, animator of elements. <coughs> this is actual hot, how, it, how I did it. I don't know, is it good or not, but it works. So this is the same timeline with green sock. Stagger from two method, uh, it's same like transition group in Vue.js, but it's uh, in green sock, so animate an array of elements. And here, after all the animation done, I don't even need to know how much time it will take. All I know that when it's resolved, it's done. And the next video, God knows what does it mean, huh? I don't remember. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh -huh. Aha, the next video is animating page outro all together. So because we use promise all the way, the promise is all the way, uh, each method resolved when it's done. Like before we leave the page, before I leave the page, I'm firing the animate page outro method. And then I'm waiting until each animation will finish. Like I, hide, I fire the hide main animation and also I uh, hide the logo, the text body moving animation, the button, and the link about. And only then, I hide, be, hide it background. And when promise all, as you know, it fires when all the promises were resolved. So after the image paid outro method resolve it, I fire the view rotor hook next. As you can see, I don't have any timex here. I don't know how, my, how, how long it takes. It doesn't matter, it just works. This is uh, another great thing I like. Like You don't need to remember how many animations you fired. You can add it or remove some animations from there. Anyway, it's gonna work. And this is the view rotor navigation hook, guard, that allows us to wait until the animation will finish before we leave the page. So this is the method from the previous slide. We launch animate page outro. It waits until all the animations done and only then we fire the method next. The thing is before we launch the next function the page will not change like the view rotor waits until we launch the next uh, method so this is why uh, the page didn't change until we perform all animations. And now, when you can, when you see this uh, video again, I hope that you probably understand how it works. Like this is before the page leave, we wait until on animation is performed, and only then we move into the next page. And on the next page, the same method with green sock, the elements appear one by one. So you can control the rotor state animations with the in component guards as well. If you need to perform some animation, especially on the page, like only on one page. You can use in components guards, it's before route enter, before route update, and before route leave, if you want to add something extra. And uh, you can see all the live example at 2017.bespravok.ru. And if you want, you can check out the new website, bespravok.ru, I released it yesterday. But you need uh, the scope web browser reason WebGL and videos a lot and Safari don't allow us to play video with sound. So <clears throat> please check it out. If you have uh, if you have any question, ask me. But before I finish, I want to offer you to 
take a look at uh, some videos if you want to know more about animation and you speak Russian. I'm sorry, <laughs> this is the, the first version of this uh, talk was in Russian. There is the rendering 16 millisecond talk of Gleb Mihaev. It's really great about uh, how to make performance, how to make performance animation. But also check out the animating Vue.js of Sarah Drasner. She talks in English. And state animation getting done right of Eduardo, he talks in English as well. And after this, probably you will know much more than about Vue.js animation than me. So if you have any questions, please welcome. I'm all. I think it's time to introduce myself. My name is Andrei Gromyshev. I work uh, in Acronis web development team. And uh, my team, well, actually me, uh, I don't know what kind of developer I am, but uh, everybody call me full stack guy. So backends, DevOps, in the front end, testing, many things, automation. And uh, the problem uh, I wanted to uh, share with you and uh, the tool chain. Because the tool chain is the something that uh, works with your code. And uh, if we talk about the uh, Vue.js or any modern JavaScript framework or library, it's, it's, it's many things happening in the hood. And uh, really, I see many examples that developer don't know this tool chain or they just don't care about it. It works, they work on defaults. And uh, I just wanted to ask a few who are you? Are uh, who? How many are you using Vue CLI, for example? Okay. What about the others? I mean, uh, I've seen many uh, hands raised. Uh, the users of uh, Vue.js. So I mean, you work without Vue CLI. Am I right? Okay. <laughs> so uh, you set up Webpack on your own. Good. Uh, the agenda. Uh, we will talk about the Vue.js application infrastructure. So it will be like overview, what's what's going on. Uh, the explanation, what do you, I, need Vue CLI? And uh, the thing that will simplify your life. Vue CLI, the changes between version two and three, it's very important to understand what's going on because it brings so many things that changed under the hood including Webpack 4 and Babel uh, that are work under the hood, maybe if you don't know. And uh, the first thing is uh, overview of intro. So we live in two big um, layers. Okay, the language specification you use, maybe you're a um, TypeScript lover or uh, ECMAScript fanatic uh, or maybe Dart. Uh, adapt. I see some people here. Yeah, and the tooling that uh, works under the hood, the thing that transpile your code, it's making, it's reading those JSONs, it's uh, publishing your assets, it's chunking, it does lots of things. So the languages, uh, ECMAScript six, and uh, a lot of things that we already use now or maybe don't. Who use dynamic imports here? Okay, not much. Uh, TypeScript, who use TypeScript? Well, not bad. <laughs> okay, uh, and after the language specification, we go deeper. We go with the Webpack, this example is a bundler uh, the loader, well, I mean, do you need the pack with with Vue.js without the loader? Okay, of course, you need loader. CSS preprocessors, of course, you don't write all those uh, CSS um, on your own. You don't put those uh, browser hints, prefixing things. Uh, you don't, okay, this this absolutely required thing. Bundling and chunking, polyfilling is a really important thing here. Uh, asset fingerprinting, busting your cache, giving 
uh, your clients the uh, the most recent builds of your application. Bundle analysis is a part of your tool chain. Uh, who used bundle analyzer? Okay. Linters. Okay. And the testing infrastructure. So I'm not asking about the testing. <laughs> yeah? Okay. So the view CLI. Uh, it's Webpack. Yeah? Uh, do you set up Webpack on your own? Well, we're too lazy. We won't write the code, deliver something to production as soon as possible. The pack is complicated. Even uh, core team developers of Webpack, they say the Webpack is a complicated thing. It's not easy to learn. And sometimes you need to scale the team, you hire new people, and uh, well, you can give them something. Well, do it, it works, just don't think about it. Well, uh, if you work with your own setup of Webpack, you will always have, like, you have to learn Webpack, and it takes a month, I think. Uh, I mean, to know it really good. And that's the problem. Uh, Vue CLI gives you Webpack. It gives you some jump starts, scaffolding, some structure, like Vue.js. Anyways, the Vue.js, why everybody use frameworks? Because they give you a structure. I mean, it's absolutely arranged. Here is routing, here is this, I don't know, store, uh, templates, syntax, uh, the naming, even convention of, uh, naming conversion of uh, templates, uh, components file, uh, testing infrastructure, a lot of things. So it gives you everything out of the box. Uh, in, in simple cases, uh, I can say that Vue CLI will fit most of your needs. So like 95%, works on the defaults. So we just need kind of tweak here, there, but it's like 10 minutes and it all works. Wow, magic. And of course, best options provided by community. I will stop on this point a little later because there are lots of hints and hacks going on. And if you build, for example, a Webpack config on your own, you can step into that trap and spend lots of days Googling, Googling, Googling and trying to apply, this, apply those changes. So it's it's headache. And of course, it's well documented is uh, any Vue.js thing, like router and everything. It's wonderful documentation. And here's our view between uh, version two and three. So what we had in Vue 2, uh, Vue CLI version two, it, it was just Webpack template scaffolding tool. So it gives you some CLI command that you run and you have a couple of folders with magic files. That's it. Yeah, it was Babel 6. Uh, I will talk about Babel a little later, but, well, it's a problem. Uh, proposals, for example, spread operators, dynamic imports, null callers. No, you have to set it up on your own or maintain your personal GitHub storage uh, Webpack template. Unlucky you are. It's hard to maintain and update. Well, I faced this many times because when we started a couple of projects like two years ago with Vue CLI 2 and Vue CLI, they were updating the Webpack, uh, Webpack template and we wanted to keep updated. It was like a well, headache because we changed something or maybe we put another linter and the linter changed the formatting of those config files and then you just doing diff to GitHub. Well, it's not funny. It, it's time. Why do we spend? So, V3, Webpack config is a scope package. You don't see it. It's somewhere there in node modules. Wow, it's cool. You have some config writing hook points. You just have one config.js file where you can hook into any part of your Webpack pipeline. But here's the problem. Does, does anyone see the problem here? What's the problem? You don't have your config files between on, on your screen. It's somewhere under the hood. And for example, if you're not expert in Webpack, you don't know what you're trying to change. You don't even to Google what to Google. Where is that? Where's those chunkings? And it's somewhere there. 
Wow, but you have a wonderful option. You don't need to copy and paste configs between projects. You just pull in, okay, five packages and you're good to go. And you don't need to eject, as Evan, you said. It's really cool because you overwrite the things like you know, aliases for your folders and uh, you're good to go. You don't have to eject. Uh, yeah, and of course, performance, modern mode, and UI. Well, I love UIs. And uh, by the way, uh, who use modern model modes today? Who provides two chunks at the same time? Oh, oh, okay. So, um, a brief overview, really shortly. So, view CLI v3 UI. So, you have like wonderful built in UI that you run through console. You have some options to run your tasks, see what's going on, see the warnings, the size of assets, the modules. Uh, you can add more plugins uh, provided by community or maybe your own. Uh, you can even set up dependencies here. Well, it's madness. I mean, from UI, you can pull in something cool. <laughs> well, I, I don't know why it's really needed, but, well, it's cool. Uh, you have lots of information like, you know, speed stats, how fast will it load, the assets, the dependencies. Uh, you even have some Webpack Bundle Analyzer here and you can review all of your chunks. Personally, for me, this screen looks a bit raw because the original uh, Webpack Bundle Analyzer UI is much more informative. So this one is kind of um, gigabit, I don't know. And yeah, it's now in Bulgarian. <laughs> Thank you, Dobromir. Uh, well, the real project migration. We did recently, well, a week ago, the real project. It was, it's big. You saw the stats, it's like eight megabytes. <laughs> and uh, you see the numbers, 37 seconds, and just updated without any code changes absolutely on V3. It's 15 seconds. It's not even incremental build, it's just uh, form cache build. And instead of Oh, sorry, it's, 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 it's missed. Of course, the 46 should be here, 98 should be here. So we have uh, twice less packages. That's cool. That's really cool in package JSON. And uh, this is how the regular, regular V2 and V3 project looks like. So in V2, you have like the build folder with all those crazy files, the config, and uh, so many things. I mean, you have to learn it, support it, and so on. So in V3, you have uconfig.js, and that's it. It's all, nothing. Uh, going next with the project, I just showed you the numbers. So many things changed under the hood. So if we talk about the Webpack, Webpack is four now, and uh, I will talk about it a bit later, but they removed a common chunks plugin at all, which they just wipe it off. And uh, yeah, by the way, this is the screen of Webpack Bundle Analyzer. So if you don't use it, you have to, because it can show you the stats and everything what's going on in your bundles. So this is the thing that was using Vue CLI 2 then Magic, things changed, why? Well, that's because the chunking system in uh, Webpack 4 changed significantly. It works absolutely differently. And you have to be aware of this issue because when you expect one thing on a Webpack 3, on a Webpack 4, it will be the different story. Uh, you have to think deeper and understand how it works and uh, how to debug those issues. I'll tell you a bit later. Uh, this is a comparison of uh, stat generated files. So the same project 
it's version 2, it's version 3. Well, when 20, to 26 to 27, okay, a little bit smaller overall. But you see the chunks differ. they different, and it's not the magic. And about the modern, uh, yeah, the Philip Walton, this guy from Google Chrome uh, core team. So this is uh, his uh, blog quote. So the problem is that we blindly use polyfills. We just polyfill. We don't care about the modern browsers. But let's be honest. 95% of people use the browsers that support ECMAScript modules. And we polyfill for like 5% of the people. We polyfill and we deliver this crazy numbers of bytes through the wires. Why do we need this? It's madness. Yeah, and the cat asking you, stop it. Don't do this. Because Vue.js, by the way, with Vue CLI 2, gives you this out of the box. So what's going on here? You have magic script type module that each browser that understands ECMAScript modules will use. So they will find this type module, they will load this bundle. And the second hint is a script no module with the legacy bundle. So it means you, using for example Vue CLI, use option modern, the webpack generates you two bundles. The one that with polyfills, with all those things that does Babel. And the second one with modules true, if you know what I'm talking about. And you have two bundles that works good. So modern browsers would load this one and skip the loading this one, while the older browsers work inverse. But of course, there are things. Oops, sorry. Whoa, something goes wrong, sorry. Uh, yeah, and of course, if you do this on your own for Webpack, you will find, find some crazy issues. For example, Safari 10.1, they ignored this one. So they will load two uh, bundles at the same time. You will be unhappy with this and uh, you will spend time Googling what's going on, but you see like solve this issue for already. They already have some hacky polyfill inside. Webpack 4. Well, a lot of things changed. The node for the build speed improvements, the tree shaking with side effects, which is a really important thing because the side effects allows you to tell Webpack what it can wipe without scaring to destroy your application. So this will help to eliminate that code smartly, more smartly. They, they move uh, to that option. So it's, it's, it's really complicated mechanics between, between, uh, inside tree shaking. So it's, it's not easy to create that abstract syntax tree that can be understand it. Well, we don't need this, we'll need this, well, we don't need this because everything is one chunk, another chunk. Well, it's craziness, but the side effect is a good step ahead. Uh, you don't have to create some crutches doing with those uh, env packages, if trying to override configs for development, production, testing, uh, or maybe you build your application in Electron. Well, I had seven environments in uh, UCLI 2, and it was craziness. Now you have an internal mode presentation in uh, Webpack 4. And of course, new module types. Now you can purely, without any transpiling, get the JSON file. Well, that's, that's good. And some overview, like common chunks plugin that was removed. I already mentioned this, and some uh, no things like model concatenation plugin, which is a scope hosting, obviously. 
uh, Uglify.js with Pack Plugin version one. Finally, in your Webpack, you don't have to put it and then replace everything in your Webpack config. So lots of things done for you for free. And uh, a little about Common Chunks plugin. So the magic I showed you before on the screen with those uh, bundles uh, on uh, reporting of uh, bundle or a time analyzer. So some magic happens here. And that's, that's because the way you can configure the chunks and the way you use your chunks. So do you use dynamic imports? Do you use static imports? Do you use dynamic and static imports of the same library, same library at the same time in the same project? Well, these options will help you to tune this behavior. Who will win? Babel 7. Well, it's great change. This is the why, actually, Vue CLI and Webpack 4 started to be fostering. This is the main change here. A uh, couple of changes from uh, Google Chrome, oh, sorry, V8 core team. And uh, move to scope package. No more thousands of Babel folders in your modules, the node modules. It's now inside its own scoped package, which helps you to solve many problems with the project's naming, for example, when the people were pulling in Babel env but not president, it was a crazy thing. And what you have to do, you have Webpack, you have your setup, so remove any Babel present stage X forever, add this line, remove all those like ES 2015 stage zero one anything, and uh, just enjoy, it will work, and it will work better. Yeah, I'm crying, I'm happy. So the proposals. The proposals was, uh, who of you are subscribed to some proposals of uh, TC39 committee? Okay. So things change and uh, many new features appear in the language. And uh, regularly it was like the people were adding some plugin which was known like plugin syntax something stage zero one and so on. You push it uh, to your package JSON and then you pull it and then you forget about it and something happened, something break at the same. So there, wo there was no consistency. So you could pull some package with some crazy name and it was madness. So the guys from the Babel core team, they decided that consistency naming proposal to stage four is important. So plugin proposal name, plugin transform name, and you have strict understanding that this is proposal, it's not stage four yet, it's not in JavaScript. And this is definitely already stage four. That's cool. Use built-ins. Wow, I love this one. This is crazy because well, I'm sure many of you did this. Yeah, this is that polyfilling I've been talking about, like this modern builds and so on. So what this option does, this option allows you, by default, it uses usage, to replace the promises in the runtime. So you don't have to write those baby polyfill, it's big. And you target to some like two versions, two last versions of a browser. So if they support like, I don't know, catch finally the promises. And so it will add only that promise that needed in a place. And then, of course, this will happen uh, additional extraction when web Webpack works. So it will like pull this promise only one time, push it to some chunk, and well, it's cool. The size of your build getting uh, smaller you're getting faster in the build time, you're delivering the smaller builds to your clients. Whoa, cool, that's really cool. I love this feature. So you definitely have to check it out. So, and there are also options like entry and false. Uh, entry like does one great baby polyfill in it at the start of your chunks and forget about it. The more secure option.
So, well, like usage is like experimental thing, but uh, as for my experience, you can use it in production already, no problems. And it's just 60% faster. Yeah. Thank you. So today I will be talking about form validation. Um, I guess speaking in English will be fine for you. Most of you know English already. Uh, so uh, yeah, we'll talk about validation with uh, without any plugins and then with plugins. So a few words about me. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, okay. So I'm Dubromir Christoph. I'm a lead front end developer at HiveFactors. I have more than three years of view experience in my uh, career, professionally. And I'm also part of uh, the View Bulgaria team. Uh, some of you may know me from uh, Saturday where we had the, the first <coughs> uh, workshop uh, for View in Bulgaria, uh, which actually turned out pretty well, uh, if I do say so myself. Uh, I'm here with, uh, actually with a few of my colleagues, uh, Nedialko, Elena, and Chris, who helped me a lot with the, the whole um, uh, workshop. Um, and yeah, so the agenda for today, I uh, will be talking about validation with Vue without any plugins. Then uh, we will see how to actually use a plugin called Validate. Some of you may know it already, so if you do, I'm sorry, it's going to be probably boring for you. Um, we'll look at custom validate validators, how you can create your own, how you can actually manage large forms, because we all have had big forms. Um, how to show messages per error, per field, which is a UX kind of thing. And later, uh, at the end, I'll show you a plugin called Validate Error Extractor, which I built, because I actually saw a nasty thing that I really didn't like about how view to date works in general. Cool, so validation, validation without any plugins, as you all know, we have essentially two types of validation. We have server and we have the client side. And I am pretty sure most of you don't even do client side validation, you just pretty much leave it to a Laravel or whatever API you have in the back end and it just serves you something. And yeah, that's okay, but UX-wise, not the greatest thing in the world. Um, and I truly think that we should have uh, both. And with Vue, it's actually pretty simple. Okay, live, code, live demo. So, essentially, uh, if the code sandbox actually f <laughs> builds, it'll be cool. Anyway, uh, cool, so we have a form. This is the almightiest of forms. You have a name and an email. So validation, what should do? It should just, when you submit, it should show you some feedback. Whoa, okay. And yeah, pretty much if your name is, is uh, invalid or your email is invalid, it should give you some feedback. And once you start typing, it should go away. Same for email. So if you have some, any valid email, I'm sure you're very interested in looking seeing this. Cool. So yeah, pretty much this is, the, you've, everyone has seen such validation. How could we implement it with Vue? Well, for the most part, you just need a form object. You need to define your field, the fields you're actually tracking, which for our case is name and email. Um, dirty fields, so you don't show the errors immediately. And then we can have three computed properties. One is just the has errors, which as you may or may not know, computed properties recompute and uh, return new data every time their um, dependencies change. So the has errors will return a Boolean whether is name valid or is email valid is true or false. And if we look at bo both of those uh, computed properties, what they do is essentially they just pretty much check if the, each of the, the fields is there because we want them to be required. And for the name, if it's um, the minimum of 10 symbols. And both required and min are functions that I actually had to write on my own because you don't have them in the view out of the box. So I just extracted them outside and made them so they're actually reusable. As you can see, I'm actually reusing the required one on the email. And for the most part, when you submit, you just check if has errors is true and you set your dirty 
dirty bullion to true. And yeah, if it's if it's uh, valid, I guess you just do your thing. If not, you just return and force the, the user to update. So yeah, on the on the, on the template side, you just check if the is, is name valid is uh, false, and you check the dirty and yada yada yada. You know, uh, super boring. So what's the outcome? Yeah, so the pros, it's super simple for small forms. You just have like a few computed properties and you're done. Uh, computed properties out to compute on the fly every time, so you don't have to worry about that thing. And you can extract your common validators. The cons though, you need to define your computed properties for every single field you are trying to track. You need to update on multiple places your has errors, you need to play it on the templates. It's a lot of updating, which uh, you need to keep track of your dirty fields on your own. If you need to track for each individual field, that's that's pain. A lot of extra boilerplate, and everything's super error prone. I mean, it's fine, but meh. No. Okay, so let's look at how Vulidate actually can help you remove a lot of that boilerplate. Oops, not this one. So for the most part. Uh, Validator is actually a data model oriented validator. So I'm pretty sure a lot of you have used, which use Vue, have used vValidate, right? How many of you have used vValidate? Well, that's so many, like four people, okay. How many of you have used Validate? Same number, okay, fine. Uh, so data model oriented means that your rules actually pretty much resemble or if not look the same as your data structure. Whereas the other kind where vValidate uses it uses inline uh, directives on each individual input, which you can imagine the bigger your forms gets, you have to dig and dig and dig into that template to find your rules, which is, for me, is just not, not, not okay. The data model oriented one is easy to understand because it looks almost the same as your data. Uh, Vulet actually allows you to have dynamic rule sets, which means you can change your rules depending on certain criteria that you have. Uh, it allows for asynchronous rules, so you can do API fetches and, and checks if your email is um, free or the name is free or whatever. Uh, it auto-tracks dirty fields for you, so you don't have to do it on your own. Uh, and it has a lot of pre-built validators out of the box. So how does it look like? Well, you just import the ones, the validations that you need we define our data as we used to do before. But then we have our validations. And as you can see, the form actually looks pretty much the same. We have the name and the email, but this time we only define what we're actually validating against. So the name should be required, the email as well, and we just wanna know if the email is, is, is a proper email. And both of these are actually shipping with the data out of the box. Oops. No. Okay, this is the form, I hope. Okay, so how does it look like? Well, same as before, if we submit, if it's less than 10 characters, it's uh, it errors out, if it's more, it's fine. Same with the, same with the email, if it's, a, it's a pro if it's a proper email, well, that might not be a proper one. It should, yeah, be green. Yeah, cool. So, works the same way as before. Um, so what's the outcome? We have less boilerplate, we have less repetition, we have less developer errors because you don't have to define all these things on your own and you have the automatic dirty field tracking. Nice. Okay, so yeah, what about custom ones? Uh, let's say you really need to track some very specific rule that Vulet doesn't have. What do you do? Well, for starters, they have a lot. And these are not all of them. This is, this is like a, 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 a chunk of them. And from, from just looking at them, these are probably most that you'll be needing anyway. Although, if you really need something specific, custom validators are just functions that, re that should return either a Boolean or a promise resolving a Boolean. And they receive the value of the field that you're trying to uh, validate now. And as a second param, they receive the whole uh, component context. So you have your, your data, you have your computed properties, you have your methods, you have everything. 
so let, let's see how we can actually define uh, custom validator. So let's say we want to know if the value is not Joe. Well, we just have value and we check if it includes the word Joe. And if it does, then that's an error and we just return a false. Same for is not Gmail. If uh, the, the, the email that you have includes the word Gmail in it, then we return an error. You can even have some fancier stuff like this amazing regex that I have, which just checks if uh, your, your um, value has any of the character list uh, forbidden illegal characters. Usage is very straightforward. You just import them and you define them in your validations, same as you do with the, pre the inbuilt ones. <clears throat> and let's see actually if there is any change in what we had before. So name should not be Joe. What happens if it's Joe? Yeah, should not be Joe. If it's Joe, the error's out. If it's not, if it, if it's not, then it's fine. Yeah. So our relations work, and the email should be at least ten characters for this one. And yeah, it works. If but what if we have Gmail? Yeah, no, no, not Gmail. Well, it should be gmail.com, but as, as you saw, the, 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 our rule was not perfect, so. Cool. What about large forms? So probably most of you have had like big forms that are like huge with a lot of fields and but they just get humongous and very hard to maintain. Uh, so a common approach is to split your logical parts into subcomponents. So you can have a email email component, you can have a name component, you can have a cart, I guess, a, a product, whatever. And you keep all your form data on the parent. So all of the data actually gets passed to all of the children that actually require it. And you only pass the data to the child that it actually needs. You shouldn't really pass the whole form. Then you just emit all the emit changes to the parent. You don't have you shouldn't and I'm I'm like very uh, you know strict about it. you shouldn't mutate data on the children itself because then things get very hairy. And yeah, so then the parent just has to pass the valid data down to the child. So the child actually knows if the data in the parent is actually wrong. And only the parent is responsible for submitting the form to the server. An example of child implementation is, let's say we have a complicated email field, like very complicated. <laughs> and what we do is we can use the, the V dot uh, dollar error, which is our the validator we, that we're passing, and we're checking if uh, the error has any, is, is true, so we can apply on a has error class. And the other thing, uh, the, the rest of it is just our plain boilerplate that we had on, on the email, with the exception that now we're remodeling uh, a computed property. And on the right, we, uh, we actually have the script for the component, and we have a value, which is a string, we have a V, which is our validator prop. And we have a computer with a getter and a setter. Uh, I like to use this because it actually makes my component very a lot smaller when I uh, work with um, uh, child components. And I can actually leverage V model. So defining a getter and a setter, we essentially say, yeah, the email will get this value as its, as its uh, value. And every time we try to set the value, we touch the validator, which means we say it now it's dirty, uh, so it should, uh, it should show if there's an error. And we emit an input event with the new value that we had, so the parent can actually uh, handle it. And using this, this child is pretty straightforward. We just have uh, the, 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 comp the component itself, vModel, the, the data that we're um, changing, and we pass the <coughs> the current uh, validator as, as a prop. And as you can see, this is actually very uh, descriptive. We exactly know what this component is, what it does, just by, uh, just by the name. Uh, yeah, but what about error message display? We need to show the, the, the user some more the errors. We, we, we can't just like, have it read and nothing. It could be like 50,000 things. 
Um, so the good thing about this kind of thing is it's very good for the UX because the user can actually instantly know what's wrong. They get immediate feedback. Um, so how something like this should look like, if we submit the form, we immediately know that the name is required and uh, the email is required. So if you start typing, it, it tells us, yeah, the name must be Joe. So in this case, we actually have to have a name that's Joe. So if we go Joe, yeah, so now we don't have any errors. Same for the email. We, we need to have a valid email. Uh, some valid email. Yeah, so now yeah, no errors, user knows everything is fine, they can submit the form and everything is peachy. Uh, but how do you actually extract the, the errors from Vulidate? So that monstrosity over there means that you have to check each individual validation rule. You have to have text for each rule. This is super repetitive. This is very error prone, it's time consuming, it's a lot of boilerplate, it noises up all of your templates. And I had to do that every time I had a field. I couldn't stand it, so what I did, I just built a, a, a library, which is called Vulvate Error Extractor, which does this for you. And you might be thinking that's the worst name in the world and I can absolutely agree. I have no idea why I named it like, like that and it's awful and people cannot remember it like at all. No, I'm dead serious. Like, I should have named it something else. Violate errors or violate messages or something. Okay, so uh, same thing as before. Currently though, we'll be using Foundation 6 as a uh, CSS framework because I just like Foundation. And same as before, if we uh, start typing, the field tells us immediately what's wrong. We have, an, uh, we have a, um, uh, a message, the name, sh the name is required, the name should be Joe, same as before, absolutely same as before. Uh, I'm not gonna type an email again. We even have a, a summary of errors on the top. So how do you actually use this? Well, before, remember, we had to define all of those errors, check it against each one. It was super, super annoying. Well, now you just wrap your input in a, in a form group. That's it. You just pass it the validator. Nothing else. Absolutely. Like, look at how much boilerplate you're saving. You don't have to assign classes. You don't have to add labels. You don't have to check for errors. Nothing. And the installation is super straightforward. You just pull it in. You tell it if you want... Um, to have uh, interna internationalization, uh, we support view E18N. And uh, you just define a set of uh, common messages that you, that you have. Uh, because 99% yeah, like of the time, once you define those uh, common ones, like uh, required, minimum length, yada yada, email is not valid, they will be the same for all of your, all of your errors and all of your fields. And at the end, you just have to register your form group component. And you can use actually one of the, the pre-built ones. Let's say I'm using the foundation one that uh, the, the, the library ships with. So what are the pros? Well, we have templates for foundation, for bootstrap three and four. We uh, predefined, uh, you can predefine your common reusable error messages as you, as you saw, so you don't have to write them out every time. And you're consistent. Uh, V18N, which is a killer because you don't have to do the whole dollar and like the, the full name of the, the, the error message. It removes all the repetitive work. As you saw, you don't have to define all the errors all the time. It extracts all the errors for you. It obeys the dirty rule check automatically. It knows. It's very simple to use. And it's super extendable because actually it's, it's just a mixing. So you can uh, mix it in your component and just extend it. I'm going. What about custom error components? Let's say you have your own special component using some special in-house in uh, CSS library that you, we, we just don't support because we can't. Well, you just pretty much define your own. Uh, you can use the one of the, uh, the has errors or the is valid computed properties that we ship with. And you just have a slot. And you can then just loop the active error messages uh, computed property, which is just a, a simple uh, array of errors. 
and you just display them. And yeah, you just have to import the single layer extractor, mix it in, just mix it in. That's it, nothing else, nothing more, nothing more super complicated. <clears throat> and we have actually a few available uh, properties that you can use. Uh, just you can use active errors, you can have the active error messages, which is the, the messages extracted. You can have the merged, mer merged messages, which actually allows you to, uh, over oops, which allows you to override um, messages per field. So if your required is a message is like something like, your field is should be required, but on this specific field you need something more explanatory, like the field that you're trying to use is not blah, 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 or something, you can actually override them in line. Uh, same for, uh, let's say, you can have your first error, last error, has errors, a, a lot more. There are very, very a lot more. Uh, so what about other UI frameworks? A lot of you may be using Element UI, iView, all of these. Well, there are examples for each individual one in the docs, so you can actually use it with all of them very easily. Um, but there's more. Billy Mays, if you don't know who he is. Uh, our, yeah, like our teleshop stuff. So, Sometimes you just need to have a summary error component, which stays on the top, and when, once you submit a form, it just tells you you have all of these errors, or you do a pop-up or something. Uh, oh yeah, so there's a, actually a, an example. <laughs> yeah, live transpiling with Webpack. Takes time. Cool. We submit, and we can see actually all the, all the errors on the top. Once we start actually typing, because it's reactive and it's connected, those actually change on the fly with the phone. And because we use actually, um, uh, because we use, uh, I think this is with the foundation again, we can even have uh, coloring for success and stuff. Cool. So how do you actually use the form summary? We just define a form summary component and you pass it the validator, that's it. It's super extendable, you can, it can work with like very deeply nested validators. Uh, it auto assigns the field names, so it knows if it's a, if it's a name, if it's a email, if it's a anything, any else uh, that you can think of as a field. Uh, it works with each, so you can have, um, collections of um, uh, validations. It also has bootstrap and foundation templates included as well. Uh, yeah, and that's it. Yeah, you can find more about me uh, on these places. So uh, I actually write articles on Medium. I'm very active on, uh, on GitHub, uh, uh, Twitter. Yeah, my, my GitHub is semi-active. I try to contribute as much as I can. And you can find me on, actually on Discord uh, as Dobromir Christoph. so I'm pretty much always there, trying to help people out as much as I can. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Dobri. The question is, uh, do you support uh, asynchronous uh, configuration of uh, error messages? So, I mean, uh, I switch the language or the things change and yeah. I need to pull the translations. So uh, will it reflect asynchronously? Uh, yeah, sure. So if you're using Vue e E18N, uh, it, because everything is te technically a computer property, all of this will change on the fly. Uh, the question is that you will have to fetch your um, error messages asynchronously yourself because it's uh, the part of the view. Yeah, it's, everything will be updated automatically, yeah, because everything is computer properties. Uh, here we go. I hope you are not tired today, yet. So, uh, my name is Ilya Klimov. I'm from Kharkiv, Ukraine. Uh, I do various things. I'm writing in JavaScript for already like 14 years in a row. I'm running my small outsourcing company for six years and Vue was like one of the primary technologies for the last couple of years or so. 
So the top is the logo of my company, the bottom, the right bottom is my educational courses in Russian called javascript.ninja, and the left is well, the cat, everyone actually loves cats. So, uh, our technology stack in our company started far, far away six years ago with Backbone.js, after that AngularJS, after that we switched to React, and after that it, here came Vue. And the view, how does the feel, uh, how does the view feels for you? For me, it feels like magic. The things were cool, the things were smart, but you know, if you use magic without the proper knowledge, one day this magic will backstab you in the most unexpected way. And I would like, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of Linux, uh, and I've been a big fan of Linux Torvald, so talk is cheap, show me the code, let's see something in real world examples. Uh, so here we go. Uh, I've built a very simple demonstration app. Uh, nothing extra here, like a thing with changing uh, one thing with different mottos, inspiring people, a list of speakers, and a button where you can share your love, and you know that marketing people, they love tracking everywhere. So let's imagine every time you click the button, you are sending like Google Analytics event, whatever. Since we, we, do not, we do not able to see Google Analytics tracking, I just added the pop-up here, it's like calling the analytics event. So nothing extraordinary, but let's try you know, the people come and say, hmm, let's make some changes. You know, this thing is not so good. Uh, could we please have something like maybe carousel here? So uh, let's start and try to do some carousel. Uh, I, since we are pretty short on time, I prepared some code for you. Actually, the original code is pretty simple. Nothing extraordinary. Sorry, I'm very bad in HTML and CSS. I'm a JavaScript developer. So any objections are welcome. But whatever. Uh, we have the computed function for displaying the, that inspiring things. We have send love button handler, which increase the love counter. Sends event. I re and on mounted, we set interval, changing next motto in one second. OK, uh, let's switch to the, uh, let's try to extract some logic to the carousel. Uh, since, uh, uh, one second. Uh, mm, okay, did check out, sorry. I, of course I've prepared some code since we are short of time. So we have the carousel initial, git check out. One carousel initial. Here we go. So what have I done? I've, uh, I've took the slick component. I know there are a bunch of components uh, have implementing the carousel on view, but this is the idea. Sometimes you had to integrate with HTML components or, you know, if you are a hipster, you can think about slick carousel in this demo like a web component. Everyone loves the web components, the upcoming, the future, and we will not be using a jQuery stuff here at all. So, I've extracted the carousel, I initialize the carousel on the mount hook, and nothing more, yeah? Here we have section, 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 let's see what we have. Yeah, here comes magic, so it works. Nice, still works, miracle. Uh, so, uh, here come, here we have uh, marketing people say, you know, uh, right now, the people do not see each talk, so we want to have an event uh, when, uh, each time when we swipe the carousel, you know. Uh, also, another people come and say, hmm, we found that this motor is updating not so often. Could you please make sure that uh, when you swipe the carousel, the motor is also updated? Well, the carousel has, uh, the slick has built an event here. The one after changing slide is obviously called after change. And the one after, uh, uh, and the one uh, after swipe is called obviously swipe. So, you obviously want something like here. We have the carousel component. 
And I want to be able to write after change is, uh, what do I want after change? After change, I want to send event change. Yeah. And on uh, swipe, I would like to have uh, next motto, I assume. So basically, we need somehow to bypass events to the carousel. Well, let's have a try. Uh, if you know, if you know view, you probably know that every listen you are signing in that way are paste in the magic property dollar listeners. So what will I do? Hmm. I will say, please watch on the property listeners. You know, I smart. I know that sometimes listeners change. So I want to be able to react on that. So the handler, listeners, uh, and for each listener, oh, I know I can't use it here. I need the pure function. So what I'm going to do, I'm picking every listener available. And for each, I have the event handler. I'm going to do uh, my carousel, carousel. Oh, mm. Let's extract it to its variable so it will be faster. Yeah. And uh, I'm going just to assign these events directly to the DOM node. So I will be $C on event handler. Pretty easy, I assume. Uh, of course, if I do not miss the brackets. And uh, pretty easy, that should work. And of course, since I want this code to be initialized, I want, I put it immediate true, so this handler will also be called not only when listener change, but on component initialization. So let's have a try. Okay. Here we go, swipe, oops, nothing works. It's clear? Hmm, why? Oh, it's pretty easy, actually. Uh, this thing is getting called with immediate true before the component is initialized. Well, just next tick magic to fix that. Yeah, you know that. That's that just a bit of next tick magic. Yeah, let's have a try. Hmm. Okay. Uh, one second, I will check the, that it's actually rebuilding. Sometimes it does not work uh, when we are checking that. Oh, now it seems that it's rebuilt. At least I trust it. Oh, whatever. Uh, give me a second so we will not waste the time. Mm, oh. So, ah, you know that git. So I have the following code. Extra, ah, I forgot to, to wrap it in the dollar. So object enters listener for which bypassing. Will it work? I hope so. Yeah, we have the swipe events. But, oh, what the fuck? Swipe, two swipes, three swipes, why? It, it seems like each time it's working, but I have even more surprise for you. One, two swipes. Uh, two clicks, three swipes. Mm -hmm. Oh, what's happening? Have you ever thought what happens when you write the template? Uh, let's see. Let's pick the template and see what view compile, how view compiles it. Just a little uh, hack, you can always access the view instance by the view DevTool global hog to view. So I will call view compile, insert my component. Here, in the result, there will be render function, so they will be to string. Well, not so user friendly. So let's use the preacher just to show it to the most sane way. Uh, yeah, here we go. Just a, a bit bigger. And what do we have here? We have a very, one very important thing. And here we go. One second. Here we go. Let, look into the, we are declaring our carousel thing. And we have a swipe which Surprise, it's anonymous function. What does it mean? Each time your template is updated, the render is called, 
the new function is generated, and voila, the listener, which is declared in the carousel, gets said, and it's called because it's updated. So every time you are, you, you are not, also, I would like to show you another thing that when I'm doing things in the right way, I mean, the after change is like just calling next motor. So this is not an anonymous function. So this tool, this thing, could easily kill your performance. Yeah? And you, see, you know, probably you thought that there is no difference by writing this one and this one. Both things will work in the view. But this one will compile just to the link to the function, and this one will compile to the anonymous function. Which, will be, which may kill your performance if you are re rendering big tables or whatever. Well, well view, you, you got me a bit disappointed, but it's time to do some more things. Uh, they say, hmm, you know, uh, this one, this one is not so user friendly. Probably you should split your things, like, uh, let's do this customizable. Uh, probably we can adopt these two other meetups, so we have some data prepared and we ju could just visualize it. Like our carousel is obviously should render the carousel and we should have the way to bypass the data to it. There is a built-in way in view to do it. It's called scope at slots. I really like to view like two or three years ago because of that, because uh, slots are the way web components work. So when our framework is close to standard, it's really nice. Uh, what have I done? Oh, it's Git implementation, thank you. So uh, let's split it into slots, like uh, again, to save your time. Let's pick uh, the primate. I will share the repository for you. Uh, so let's think in, uh, it's A47. Check out A40 this 97. Yeah. So right now the template is got extremely simple. We have the section in which we are rendering oh, slot. Pretty easy. Uh, pretty easy. Also, I fixed the listener thing by doing the you know the watch handler receives listeners and old listeners, so I'm calling old listeners. <laughs> And I done one slight thing to show you the big problem. I added one thing, the updated hook, which sends when a carousel is updated, which will just send, send analytics, uh, so we will know the component uh, will update. Let's take a look how I use the carousel. I'm passing the next motto, I'm passing the send analytics. Uh, when should the carousel uh, element update? Well, uh, based on view smart reactivity system, the answer should be never. Why? The view reactivity system is, is simple and charming. The view reactivity system has the component. Each time you are calling the component, the there is a global depth array, which is empty. After that, the component is being rendered. Each time you're referencing any object in any data, so anywhere reactive, it's just being gathered to that depth dependency. And when the render is finished in the global depth, we have a list of items on which this component depends on. So in, since, since in view 2, which is not the uh, actual thing in view 3.0, uh, we are, always have uh, just one component in the middle of the rendering. We can easily gather dependencies of each component. So basically, what dependencies we have here? We have talks, we have next motto, we have swipe function. Well, let's, time to, let's have a try. So uh, swipe updated. Hmm. Well, seems sane. Yes, the component was swiped, we have updated, but let's share some love. Oops, our carousel was updated, although the love variable is not tied to carousel at all. Uh, this right now motto was updated by set timeout and we said again updated thing. What happening? Well, maybe this is this slot, this function that again anonymous function causing this trouble. Let's remove them. Saving. 
refreshing. Love, ops, still updated. Why? You know, I was under the impression that I recently discovered it when I was in uh, year one with Natalia Tepluhina, which is one of UGS community member. I sh uh, we've digged it with, uh, with her, and we found a very simple thing in uh, Vue.js source code. This is a function called update child component. This function gets called when the parent component finishes rendering and should bypass the render flag to the child components. And there are a three very simple lines here. If your component has children, we will force update it. So as soon as you're using the slots magic, as soon as you're using scope at slots magic, the reactivity system uh, built in in view, the, the only thing which made the view way more faster than react by default configurations becomes as dumb as possible. Any change to the, my main component will force carousel to trigger a render. Well, carousel has only five items. The problem we've discovered, we were handling a very big list with virtual scrolling, who had a big pre-computing data, and it was a big trouble. And the most troublesome thing here is not that bad use case. Well, every framework has its problems. The main problem here, it's very hard to invent an escape hatch when you have a React, who is, by the way, has at least a small experience in React? Yeah, so you will understand. When you have a React, you have a should component update thing. You have a possibility to implement your own logic to tell this component, stop doing an update right now. When you have Vue.js, well, it's like a Chinese government. The China, it decides instead of Vue how to deal with updates. There is no escape hitch. There is no way to prevent the carousel component updating as soon as the app thing does. Well, you know, there are a pretty very, very dirty hacks. But it's just need to know because, uh, like, you know, this thing could become a performance killer and a real trouble as soon as you, your project gets big and puts in real data, and this is what's the case for us. Well, basically, it's a two, two small things I wanted to show you today. If you are interested in getting this source code, this is here. If you are in Telegram and speaks Russian, you can find the, our, us in uh, Telegram channels called JavaScript Ninja. We are always open for complex questions, not so complex questions, whatever. And me personally is open to any questions. Hello, thank you for lectures, and I have a simple question. Why you use a not view component for demonstration carousel, but you use, uh, um, maybe, I'm not sure, it's jQuery carousel, why? Well, because uh, there is not so much use cases. Uh, uh, this use case, when you are using listeners array, is the usual, there are two legal uh, situations where you, that happen. One way is uh, uh, when you're integrating the view with something not so viewish, like slick carousel, which I picked, web component, whatever. Another use case is uh, when you are building a high order component pattern in, the, in view. Uh, if people are writing in React, you probably know that the hawk pattern is a common way to share functionality between comp splitting functionality to components in React world. But in view world, we do not have the clean way. Choosing between these two things is uh, like, uh, well, I say, well, if people don't understand high order components, I'm doomed. So I pick the jQuery. Everyone knows jQuery. And by, basically, view is good like 90%, uh, 80% of times. But uh, if your project is big one time or another, you will be integrating with something not in the view ecosystem. Uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, I have experience about work with big project, and uh, we built not only 
uh, only view page, but for this you can use uh, separate routes. You have uh, one route for, for example, your jQuery code, legacy code, and uh, different route for your view, and you only use uh, the separate listener. Maybe it's uh, normal, but uh, I not uh, understand what you propose to do with this situation. Well, uh, regarding the, the, what the use case, for example, for us, uh, we were helping the people to rewrite the big system written in some very, very dinosaur technologies. Uh, and uh, there were some components like in place which we would like to reduce in the existing big view code. That's why we had to build an interop lawyer. Regarding this, uh, you, just know, you just know to be aware of that. Uh, as soon as you move from like an anonymous functions in templates uh, to normal functions, as soon as you switch here in watcher from the watching the simple variable to the deep watching of listeners, it's not a performance trouble it is because it's short. The problem is go will go away. But uh, such a performance killer uh, could easily slip from the code review from different problems if you don't have aware of that. So it's just, well, you see, the magic of you can one time shoot you in, the, in your leg. You just know to this, that and never point a gun to this point. <laughs>